Yeah, so um, real quick, uh, announcement-wise, on your guys' way out, the, the venue had asked us to stay off the grass. Uh, this week, they, they're putting in winter grass, so if you're wondering why it's all wet and all that stuff, just so you know, uh, to stay out there. I'm, I'm going to pray. Before I do, I do have three quick announcements for us just to be aware of, uh, one of which is an update and all that, so let's start uh, with that. So as we announced last week, we decided, uh, as members, we voted on uh, moving towards uh, downtown Glendale to purchase a building down there. Um, and to renovate it and for it to be Pella's first mission, uh, the downtown Glendale mission. And we're really excited about that. In that process, the goal is to raise, by the end of October, $200,000, which is a, a big ask uh, for a brand new congregation. We totally get it. Um, the update is we're just shy of 50000 right now. Um, I know a lot of you guys have said that, hey, we're still going to give this week. We're praying about it. I get it. Everyone's somewhere on that spot. You want to pray and figure out what uh, uh, God's calling you to give in that regard. Just so you also know, we also, I think, uh, to, you know, I think this speaks to the wisdom of the steering committee, started setting aside money early on because we knew something like this was going to come up. And so we'll also be able to designate some money towards the general fund. How much that's going to be, we don't know. But as you continue to pray, just be aware that's where we're at in that uh, deal. I will say this, though. If you are a member, just as a reminder, we have a meeting next week. Now, I sent out an email this last week. Um, if you did not get that email, that or, I'm sorry, the week prior, if you did not get that email, then I need you to find me after service. Either I couldn't read your handwriting uh, based on what you wrote for your email address, or I just never got it, okay? So come up to me after service. Don't be shy and say, listen, I signed the covenant. I didn't get an email. I got like 25 kickbacks. So there's a lot of you guys who didn't get it, but it doesn't say whose email it, it is to whose. One of them was just 0000 at gmail.com. I was like, that can't be real. So just just FYI, that's, that's the other deal. The, the third thing that I want to announce really quickly is next Sunday is our last Sunday meeting outside. Now, I have no idea to Brock's point, the weather's going to be really beautiful. It's really nice right now. It probably will be nice next week, but I don't know. We live in Phoenix, and so anything below 70 is cold to us. So going into that other time, we decided that 8th of November, we're going to uh, move into the place right next door. There's actually a little dojo between the place we're buying, and then there's a dojo, and we're going to rent out this venue that this owner also owns of the place that we're buying. Uh, that seats about 150 people. So here are the official announcements of what we're going to do for those services. Okay, We are going to do three services. Now, the reason we're doing three services is at 8 o'clock, we're going to do a mask-only service, meaning it's going to be mandatory with social distancing for that 8 o'clock service. There's a lot of you guys have expressed you feel a lot more comfortable in an environment like that. We totally get it. There's going to be the venue seats about 150 people. We're going to cap it out at 50. And, and mandate masks. So the first 50 people to show up, we're not going to ask you to register. Maybe we'll do that sometime in December. But at first, we're going to get a beat on that. Then we're going to do a 915 and a 1045 regular services per the norm of what we're doing uh, in that time. And so I'll give you more details as members next week. But just so you know, we want to get, get you kind of ahead of the curve here. 8 o'clock, 915, and 1045. And that 8 o'clock is for masks only. Uh, uh, those of you who want to make sure that you know, you're in a spot where you're wearing masks and people around you are wearing masks. Cool? If you have questions, feel free to, to uh, ask me afterwards. Let me pray for our text for 2 Corinthians, and we'll, we'll jump in. Father, thanks. Um, just honestly, I guess it could go without saying, but we won't let it. Um, it's really nice out, and uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, we could just, uh, I guess we could equate it to nature or whatever, but we really do see this as a very uh, common grace gift from you. And uh, we pray that amidst uh, sitting in 2 Corinthians, you bless our time. We pray that the word of God will come alive. We pray you be with us. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you want to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to finish the first chapter today, and we're going to do the first four verses of chapter 2. Now, here's the deal about today, okay? Um, there's really, uh, there's a lot of cool things about going through the Bible verse by verse, and then there's times where it's like, that's kind of weird. I don't know what to do with that. But the cool things are, you get to talk about things you normally wouldn't talk about. If you're just going through scripture, you're going to hit a point, And if it talks about predestination, look, I mean, you got to talk about predestination. There's no dancing around it. If it talks about sex, you just, you got to talk about it, right? So you're going through it systematically kind of in order what you're hitting there. And that's awesome because maybe you wouldn't talk about that specific topic. The bad thing about that is sometimes you come across a text where you normally wouldn't talk about that topic because you don't feel like it pertains to, um, you or the moment or it really matters and, and today is kind of one of those weird deals um today we're going to talk about uh, my role with you or more specifically elders roles with you as a congregation okay and we're doing that because the text is pointing us there meaning uh every commentary i read every sermon i read or sermon i listened to 
when it had to do with uh, this text, kept going and to the pastors and to the elders of the church over and over. You would actually be surprised, maybe you're Maybe you're not, but um, as a pastor, I notice these a lot. How much of the New Testament is actually written directly towards church leadership? I mean, you have entire First and Second Timothy. All of Titus is written towards church leadership. And so today we're going to talk about that. And it might feel weird uh, to do, but I feel like um, at the end of the day, if we're going to recognize 2 Corinthians is a timely book for us for multiple reasons in regards to this cultural moment and understanding who God is, we also recognize as a young church, it might be good from the jump as you're committing to a church plant, this is our fourth week, to go, well, wait a minute, Sean, what's your role in my life and what's my role with you? And so that's what 2 Corinthians is going to do for us today. Okay, so here's where it starts uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. It reads this, but I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Let's stop real quick. If you haven't been with us before, we're going to go real slow through all these things. So uh, just some context for where we are. Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church. If you haven't been with us, know that this is actually the fourth letter to the Corinthian church. We only have the second and fourth, which we call the first and second, confusing enough. But um, he's writing this letter and he had paid a visit before. And it seemed to be, according to 1 Corinthians, it did not go well. Okay. And up to this point, he talked about he, that God is the God of comfort. And then he addressed this idea that we are not to walk according to worldly philosophy, but according to, according to godly sincerity. And then last week, we talked about we can only do that if we know who God is. And so last week, we did our best to unpack the Trinity. Now he's going to pivot, and he gives us a purpose or a reason for the pivot. What's, what, um, uh, what backs his pivot? And the backing of his pivot is this, but I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained again, I refrained from coming again to you in Corinth. Now, we saw last week, I, I painted this idea for you. Imagine Paul is uh, living towards, uh, living out by uh, the Cardinal Stadium. He works in Gilbert, and he plants a church in downtown Phoenix. And the analogy I was trying to paint was, he says he's going to stop by the church on the way to work, and then stop by uh, on the way back home, okay? And, and what we come to find out now is, he actually did uh, go visit the church on his way to work, but he didn't stop on the way home. And, and I said, maybe because he got caught up or whatever it was. And now we find out a little more detail in this relationship. It was actually intentional. He made the plans according to go, hey, listen, at the end of the day, I didn't come to you. Now, here's why. And the language he uses is, it was to spare you that I refrain from coming again to Corinth. There was what we know historically a very big issue between Paul and specifically a group of people in the church that were not uh, acting according to godly sincerity, specifically one person. And Paul goes, listen, I didn't want to come lay down the hammer again, so I didn't stop back by on my way, uh, my way home. And then, then he gets into this in verse 24. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. So we're going to actually spend a lot of our time uh, in this section. So let's kind of pause and go through each of this. I want you to look at verse 24 and see that it's broken up into three different sections here. First, it starts and it's broken up by the commas, okay? Not that we lord it over your faith, comma, but we work with you for your joy, comma, for you stand firm in your faith. The first thing I want you to see is Paul now acknowledges his relational dynamic with the Corinthian church. And here's what he says. I knew there was an issue, and I'm not trying to lord this over you. I recognize there's something, and I didn't want to come because I wanted to spare you. But the reality is there was this issue, and I'm not going to continue to hold it over. In the New American uh, commentary, I love what David Garland says. This is what how he describes his relationship. Paul pastoring this church. Here's how he describes it. He says, Paul has no desire to make uh, them his theological serfs. He does not seek to control their thinking and make them his devotees. Therefore, Paul does not browbeat his church like an un unbending dictator or manage their lives like a meddling parent. He believes in persuasion, not coercion. He exercises considerable restraint because he wants to work with them, not on them. So here's Paul's dynamic. Let's pause for a second. He sees there's an issue, but he's in this tension that we've got to acknowledge. He recognizes something very similar that if you're a teacher here, you recognize if you're a parent or have been a parent, you recognize. If you're a coach or been a coach, you recognize. There's a moment that has this weird, awkward authority in those dynamics in the human experience. Meaning, um, you can't make anyone do anything, but there's enough authority in, in, as it's agreed upon that as a parent, you can make your children clean their room. As a coach, you can make your, uh, your athlete run sprints or do whatever. As a teacher, you can make them do their homework. 
But there comes this moment, what we'll call the uh, pushing rope spectrum, where eventually you feel like you care about them more than they care about them. And so you have to talk to them about it. I don't know if you've ever tried to push rope before. It's awful. Rope is meant to be pulled, right? And eventually as you walk with someone, if you're in that type of leadership role, you realize you're walking with them and it feels like you're like pushing rope. They're not doing anything. And it feels like, I actually think I want you to have better grades than you want to have. I actually think I want you to be a better athlete than you want to be. I actually think I care. This is just true for parents. I actually think I care about you more than you care about you. That's just true, okay? Like you feel like when they're real early on, you're like suicide watch, like why are you always trying to kill yourself, right? <laughs> and even as they get older, you're like, what's happening? Uh, and so the idea is they're just, we're thinking, so what has to happen in that moment? If you've been in that environment or that role before, you know what has to come next. You have to have the talk. This isn't the birds and bees talk or, um, you know, if you're a person of color, the conversation uh, uh, with police officers and all, not that kind of talk. This is a, a talk that I think is more common to uh, the human experience. This is a conversation where you eventually have to go, listen, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And, and Paul wants to acknowledge from the jump, I'm not trying to lord this over you. But Paul has said over and over, I've seen this happen a lot with you all. As a matter of fact, I wrote a list here in 1 Corinthians. Here's a list of everything Paul had to address in 1 Corinthians as he looked and he said, it feels like I care about this for you more than you care about this for you. Then here's the, the list that I wrote out. You can, you can follow this if you ever want to go to 1 Corinthians and make your own list. He has to address the fact that they are um, identifying with worldly wisdom. And two, there's division among them. You just don't, you guys don't get it. You're trying to uh, identify with Apollos. You're trying to identify with Paul. You're missing the point. He, he uh, talks to them about sexual morality. In, in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, there's um, a son and a father. The father remarries, and the son is sleeping with his new uh, stepmom, if you will. And he goes, that's not okay, right? Uh, as you continue on in chapter 6, they're suing one another. Uh, as you continue on in chapter 7, 8, and 9, food offered to idols, it's continued sexual morality. Eventually you get to chapter 11, they're not taking communion properly. Eventually you get to chapters 12 through 14, they're not operating in the gifts properly. Over and over, Paul has said this, listen, we gotta talk about this. And if you've ever been in that role, you know what that's like. And so um, here's where I wanna say something, and, and I want you to give me grace in saying it. I think pastoring and eldering, being a leader in the church is the most unique of all of those relationships when it comes to leadership. Now, I say that very hesitantly. Side note, in the Myers household, we have a very strong no self-pity rule, okay? I learned this from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's father. There is no, like, if you want to pout about what you didn't get or what someone else getting, all that stuff, like, I do not mess around with that, okay? Now, part of that, uh, of that rule is, you can't sit there and go, well, just because um, I did this, I want people to know. There's like a braggadociousness about that whole deal. I do not deal well with that either. Now I say that because that's a rule in the Myers household, but what I'm about to communicate to you is gonna sure seem like, wow, Sean, you really are making your job seem like it's really hard. And my goal is not to put myself front and center, but just to acknowledge, uh, to enter into the text, what Paul is really trying to do. And I, I think as a pastor, as we look at this, very similar to teachers, very similar to coaches, very similar to parents, you're trying to help someone be something and do something. The difference with the pastor is we start to have conversations about your soul. And there's something unique about that. And Paul enters into this tension. And what he does is he gives the, the rubric of what my job with you or what an elder's job with you is or what a pastor's job with the church is. He give a, gives a rubric of here's what a pastor is supposed to do. And it's the next part of our section here. Look at this. So first started verse 24 uh, by saying, not that we lord it over your faith. Now look in the middle of 24. But we work with you for your joy. So let me sum up what I think Paul's saying with that statement and what I hope you know my desire is for us. You want joy. And some of you may not know that you're looking for joy in, in, in ridiculous places, but what you're looking for is joy. Dense, deep, like powerful joy. You want that. Whether you even want to say like, I'm just putting that on you. You want that. And I want that for you. And Paul uses this word here. Look at it, look at it again, okay? Uh, uh, but we work with you. That work with, soon er gas. Listen to it. Let's say it very slowly. 
Soon air gas. Let me say it fast. Soon air gas. We get an English word from this. Soon air gas. Soon air gas. Synergy. We get the word synergy from this word. The idea is that you can work for your joy, and I can work for your joy, but if we work for your joy together, we will actually have a greater outcome than us working apart. If I'm only working for your joy and you're not working for it, we're not going to get anywhere. If you're working for your joy and I'm not helping you, you're not going to get as far as we would together. And Paul's point is the pastor's job in this moment is a servant. This is what uh, Calvin says, that the, the pastor's job is not to lord over people, but to serve people. The idea is to come alongside you and hear me. I'm, I, like As I was praying for Pella Communities on Thursday, all I'm sitting there doing is thinking like, God, where are you calling them? Like, what do you want for them? What are you doing? And I'm thinking of specific people, and I'm recognizing you're trying to work towards Jesus. And I feel like my job, and I feel like what Paul is saying, and the elders of a church's job is to come alongside you to work for your joy. Now, Paul, um, he adds a, a, a caveat to this idea. It's not just some random joy, but look what he says in the next uh, part. For you stand firm in your faith. Paul believes in what he's saying, and that he's saying... I believe your joy is found ultimately is when you're most steadfast in your faith. And so what I want to do is make you steadfast in your faith. You don't have to be a pastor to understand this. If you hold to a Christian worldview right now, you understand you apply this across the board, right? You can look at somebody and go, listen, as a believer, I recognize that you can get drunk. But here's what I'm saying. I'm saying you can drink alcohol. But there's a point that you can drink alcohol where it stops being progression and it starts to regress. Meaning, I believe biblically, I can apply my worldview and go, there's a way to enjoy alcohol. Enjoy alcohol. But you can actually enjoy alcohol to the point where you're not enjoying alcohol anymore. And so what we do is we go, this is our worldview. We believe God has created the world. So we go into the groove of how he's made it. And that's where our joy is found. And so for us, I want you to hear this. As a pastor, I'm constantly trying to, as elders, we'll continue to constantly try to go, we want you to find that pocket. We want you to find that place. That we believe ultimately if you're steadfast in your faith, if you're, you're strong in your faith, that's where your joy will be. We believe in this. Now, um, I want to stop and I just want to talk uh, just across the board, um, maybe just for us in this moment. It's hard because the next part of, of chapter two, uh, which we understand better because we got the, the back half of chapter one, um, Paul puts himself in, in Greek what's called the nominative. Uh, in English, we call this the subject of our sentence. Paul makes himself the subject. And that was really weird for me as I was studying the text. Uh, it became odd because it, it, it becomes clear that Paul is trying to say, hey, listen, look at my relationship with you. I want you to look at me for a second. And as I sat on it, it was, it was odd. And so here's what I want to do. As weird as this sounds, I want, I want to express to you just for a moment, maybe it's a sidebar based on the text, how I feel about pastoring. And I want you to hear from me. And my prayer would be, you see this in me, but at minimum, let me just say it, okay? I have a unbelievable fear of being a 40-yard fake out when it comes to pastoring, honestly. I, I, I worry that, that people will see me from far away and go, Sean's a godly dude, and I'm glad he's my pastor, but you would get closer to me and you would see my devotional life and you would see that it's not there. It's, it's hollow. And, and, I, and I know homies like this, right? that they have these one night stands with their Bible on Saturday night, right? And they don't continue to date their Bible throughout the week, but they get what they want from it, extract from it Saturday night. They get, they, they explain it on Sunday. They have these friends with benefits relationship with their word. And then they're back to Monday, not looking at it again. And that scares the crap out of me because I want to be somebody that like in the same way you were to walk into a gym and you would say, Hey, listen, I, I'd like to see a trainer, right? And the next day you come with the schedule trainer and you walk in and the person just morbidly obese. This isn't about weight. Just stay with me on the analogy. Person, you would begin to question the credibility of that trainer. How can that person train me if they're not training themselves? I, I, I fear that like at a core level. So I want you to hear from me, um, for myself, the, the future elders of Pella Communities, uh, the deacons, the, the, those who lead within Pella Communities. We want to be the real deal. We really do. I want to believe when it says this, we work with you for your joy because you stand firm in your faith. Hear me. I, I want to find my joy in my faith. I really do. Now, here's why this is important. A lot of scripture being written to pastors acknowledges that's not always true. So let me just say it. Maybe you're not aware of this. That is um, maybe could be said 
but but not not uh, I don't I just feel like I'm judging the church if I say too much. This is something to be questioned within the church, I guess I'll say. Matter of fact, this is what Paul writes to. If you have your Bible, you can turn real quick. Let me just read this to you. There's an entire book specifically written to pastors, like I said early on. And it's 2 Timothy is one of those letters that's written. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screen for you. Okay? But I want you to hear this because the credibility piece is important as Paul continues to lay out um, a, a warning towards this pastor. This, this pastor's name is Timothy. He warns about these moments. So even if you choose not to stay at Pella, let's say 25 years down the road, you're looking for a new church. I hope you hear this this text, I hope you hear this idea that, that there needs to be density to elders. There needs to be something that matters, that they really believe in what they're communicating. They love you enough to tell you things that they go, I wanted to spare you this, but I have to say this to you. Because if you have somebody who's over you, who's always agreeing with you, they don't love you. They don't love you. Anybody who's been a parent knows this. Okay, so, so hear this text. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is, the, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. I want you to listen to these imperatives. These imperatives are uh, commands specifically to this pastor or to pastors at large. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. You've probably heard that before. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Here's Paul's command to, to, to Timothy, this pastor. Listen. Use the word, put it up to people's lives, reprove them, rebuke them. But listen, be patient, be, like teach them, be slow with them. They're not going to get it. You didn't always get it. You still don't get it, dummy. Like over and over, like walk with them, walk with them. Do you hear this? Okay. Now listen, four. So you need to do this. You need to root your people slowly, patiently in the word because or four, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Listen again, look at verse 3. For a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, which is a euphemism for wanting to, to hear what they want to hear, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Now, usually we think of, of teachers wanting to get more people to follow them, but Paul flips this paradigm on its head. He says, there are some of us, even here now, who like to accumulate people who agree with us, who tell us what we want to hear. And Paul says, the reason you have to root people in the word is because there's other people who will come along and want to tell them what they want to hear. And the word does not always tell you what you want to hear. If anybody who's read the Bible knows that. And then in verse four, look at this. It says, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As you like, you stop listening to the truth, you begin to wander. You begin to uh, be swayed by every form of doctrine. Hear me, this is really important. Forget myself or Pella communities for a second. The pastor's job is to root their people in the Bible because everything around them is trying to unroot that, trying to take them out of that, deroot that. Sticking out is driving me crazy. John and his cords. <laughs> Feel like Dwight, my arms won't spring. <laughs> I have to leave this as is, I guess. What's going to be happening right now? Um, okay, so all that to say, here, here's here's what I want to. Oh, it, uh, according to Second Timothy four, um, I think there's a point to say we need to acknowledge there are pastors, as Spurgeon says, it is better for a pastor to not be born than to make his pulpit an exhibit of himself. The idea is that um, let's just call it what it is. There's a lot of people, a lot of pastors specifically, who love them themselves. They love them themselves. And listen, the reason um, we have to be aware of such people is not necessarily because of the arrogance or the narcissism that's involved with that. It's because at their core, they don't love you. They don't love their people. They're, they're not willing to say, eh. And Paul's feeling this tension. So when we go to chapter 2, I want you to see this as he feels this tension. He... Um, he begins to heighten it a little bit. This is what he says in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. But I made up my mind to make another painful visit to you, that if I cause you pain, where there is to make, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? If I wrote to you as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from the one who suffered, who has uh, made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you, uh, felt sure of all of you, that my joy would be the joy of you all. 
For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now, that's going to be our text. I want you to look at this real quick, okay? I want you to see there's this word lupe in Greek, and it's the word pain. I want you to see how many times this word appears. There's a concentrated um, dominance of this word in these, these uh, four verses. It appears in verses 1 and 3 as a noun. And then it appears five times in this small little section, five times as a verb in the verb form in, in verse two twice in verse four, then in verse five twice. At the core, what Paul's saying is, let's just acknowledge this. This is hard. If you've ever been that coach or that teacher, or that parent, you know what this is like. I don't want to keep punishing you. You think I want to keep disciplining. You think that's something I want to do. And Paul's acknowledging, if I could just give a summary statement, this is wild and I and it feels almost like um, insane to say it, but here's the pastors, like, I find my joy in you finding joy. If you think for a minute, I like going to you and going, you need to stop that. You're not reading your word. You're not taking your faith serious. If you think I like having those conversations, Paul's going, you're wrong. I find my joy in your joy. And when you go off the rails, I don't love this moment. And this is concentration of pain, 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 pain. It's like, you're breaking my heart, Anakin, right? Like, it's this idea of like, I feel this. I, I, I don't know why you're going in this direction. Why over and over and over again do you continue to go to the same person? Do you continue to go to the same habit? Do you continue to go to these false loves, these synthetic cubic circomium ideas of happiness? They're, they're wrong. They're not made for you. You're, you're working against your own humanity. That's not an easy conversation. And Paul's acknowledging that. Say, part of the pastor's job is to enter into that space. And so I, I want you to hear um, uh, from me, and, and I hope that you would see this in my life, the goal for us over and over and over again is not just to, to, to make you feel good. And you might have been already here for a couple weeks and noticed, like, that's just clear. But the, the, the idea that we can say it here according to a text, that it finds itself. And then listen to this. I want you to look at this. Uh, I want you to look at verse four again. At the end of verse four, we get a reason. At the end of this, we get a reason in verse four. It says this. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, again, all this pain language, with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the, you ready? Abundant love that I have for you. What is driving this relationship is love. Love cares. Love cares enough to say what the word says. Love cares enough to see you in that relationship and says what the word says. Love cares enough to see you in your family dynamic and say what the word says. But the word says. But the word says. Love cares out of this abundant love. And so here's where I want to finish. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Because in that basis of love, bless you, in that basis of love, what I want you to see amidst all of this is um, my place or the elders' place with Pella communities. Because there's actually a theological truth. So there's a portion in scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5 that is written very directly to elders. As a matter of fact, here's how it starts. To the elders among you. So in this writing, Peter's writing this letter. This is not even Paul anymore. He says, let me talk specifically to the pastors, those who shepherd. Listen to what, what I have to say. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Jesus Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Here's the imperative, the command. Be shepherds, okay? Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. And now we define all that imperative, uh, these commands, how we do it. Be shepherds of the flock that, got, that are under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it, you can hear this, this is all Paul's language. Not lording it over those who are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Here's a, a how list for myself. This is, I get it, this is to the elders of Pella communities. This is what's written. Here's how we want you to do this. But here's a truth I need you to hear, okay? The elders of Pella communities, the elders of every church you've ever been to, the pastor of every church that you've ever been to, they are not the point of the story. They have been given one tiny sliver of this great pie and said, listen, here's what you are. Here's what I want you to know. Here's the people that are before you. But here's the good news. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. You hear that? At the end of the day, here's my role. Here's all I want to do as I work with the Spirit. 
Jesus loves you enough to want you to be firm in your faith. And he's your shepherd. He is the chief shepherd. I am part of the flock just like you are part of the flock. We are following him. We want to hear his voice according to John 10. His sheep know the sound of his voice. We want to listen to Jesus where we are according to Acts 17. We're like, um, uh, we're worshiping uh, as we continue to, uh, this, uh, what's it say? I can get this. Um, yeah, through the blood of one man, he made all the nations of the, the world pre point in time, the boundary of the dwelling, so that we would uh, worship him and grope for him in hopes that we would find him. In verse 27, we, we wander around, we're trying to find where Jesus is as we hear his voice because he's the chief shepherd. So hear me, I just want to help you listen to his voice. Dude's the man, I'm nobody. He's the one who's getting it, he's the one who's guiding you, and one day, at, a, at minimum, at a selfish level, I just want a crown. At a selfish level, at a minimum, I want to stand before Jesus and go, Lord, you gave us as elders, these people, listen, I'll read it again, I ain't making this up, I guess prosperity gospel or not, here it is. You will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Homies, I'm trying to work for that crown. I want to stand before him and I want him to say, well done. I gave you these people, you shepherded these people, these were my people. And I, I, I put them in front of you to leave for me while they were on this earth, but well done. That's what I'm looking for. And I pray no matter where you land in your life, as you say, I want to be part of a church under leadership and elders and a pastor. I pray that that would be true for them, that there'd be a real density to those leaders. Let me pray. Father, thanks for the unique opportunity to um, talk through uh, pastoring and what it means as we look at the Apostle Paul so long ago leading uh, a church. I pray, God, that as we, uh, as we continue to sit in your word, I, I pray these things would, would sit deep. Um, I pray that my relationship with every person here would grow and that more than anything, all of us, we would be trying to follow you, Jesus, the chief shepherd. You're the one guiding us and, and uh, we're in your pasture. And I pray, God, that as we continue to do that spirit, you would help us. Lord, help me. I just pray specifically for myself and future elders and fellow communities. Help us um, work with every single person here to grow in their faith so that they can find their joy. I pray that would be true. We love you and we thank you. To your name we pray. Amen.